Listen only mode. Good afternoon, Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, webinar on measuring, measuring the quality of HVAC services. services. Our, presenter Our presenter today is Paul Walsh, and I will, and hand, I will hand over to you. Him to him to I'll hand, hand over you to him in a moment. Um, um, our, webinar our webinar is under, is under the banner of HR servers. servers. And, and just to tell, just you, to tell you a little bit about, about it, the HR, the HR Observer is an initiative, initiative of the Middle, Middle East and is aimed, and is aimed at becoming a platform for HR in the Middle East and these six insights and expertise. This features, this features a blog, a LinkedIn, a LinkedIn group, Twitter feed. And, and online, online webinars to see, um, as, well um, as, as well as informal networking functions. functions. A, few a few housekeeping tips for you. As you, as you listen, to listen to Paul speak, you might, you might think of questions you want to ask him. If you, if you look, look at the, at the bottom, bottom of, your of your control panel, you'll notice the questions box. Please, please write your questions, write your questions in, here, in here, and, and Paul will take, Paul will take time, time at the end to answer them. The slides for the, the presentation today will be available for viewing later at on our slides page, page. And, the and the recording of the webinar will be posted on our YouTube channel. channel. Please allow Please us, allow us to, email to email you the links to these two resources. Two resources. When, the when the webinar is completed, a, a survey will pop up and we just, and we just ask that you give this, give this a minute or, or two of your time to lead, to lead because we because really, really feel your feedback. feedback. And all that's, and all that's left for me now is to hand over to Paul. Thank you for, Thank you for being here. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. If you're, if you're actually, actually listening, listening to this, this, this live, 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 live evening, evening, and if you're going to do it tomorrow, do it tomorrow well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Paul, as you can see my information on there on the slide. And I'd like to point out a much better picture that's been taken years and years and years ago. Years ago. So I've had so a long, long time, time in, in the, the Gulf, Gulf GCC, and GCC, GCC, and the HR, HR issues. issues. And uh, I hope I'll share some of that with you this, this afternoon. afternoon. So let's get so going. Let's get going. We find we ourselves, ourselves at this, at this moment, moment in 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, 2015, rather a dangerous, dangerous opportunistic moment in time, time for us. Uh, many many large, large corporations, corporations in HSBC, 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 HSBC are saying they're saying that to outsource HR functions. Uh, uh, this could be an this opportunity, opportunity for HR, but also, it also has a dangerous, dangerous term. Term. We have to look at why, why large corporations, large corporations and these small and these small medium, medium sized companies, companies are beginning, beginning to think, think should we outsource uh, uh, HR? HR. In many companies, many companies, of course, we could be outsourced to agencies for some time, even though it's only a partial outsourcing. outsourcing. Payroll, Payroll, commonly, commonly is outsourced, outsourced to various, various companies. companies. And we have to look and at what is happening. Is happening. Human, resources Human resources is in the middle, is in the middle of, of uh, a, a huge, huge change, change dangerous, dangerous sound 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 more and more, more, and more executives, executives and vice presidents and uh, directors, directors are asking the question, question what value, value is HR, HR actually to the company? the company? Yes, we know yes, it's really cool. Cool. We, we know you train people. Where's, 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 where's the value? Where's the added, the added value, value from what you're actually doing? doing? And furthermore, and furthermore, at the bottom of the sandwich that we seem to be trapped in, is our customers, our wonderful employees, are not too happy with the service are we looking after them correctly? Are we looking after the correct support that they need? Are we looking after them with the right balance? And just basically giving them a good, supportive, environmentally motivational environment for them to work. So that's why I want to use this webinar today our service rather than our function. I would like to start the slide. regarding the different perceptions of people between HR and other employees. Uh, some of you may have seen this before. It's a very clever survey and a very clever graph put together by Conexa. And it looks at five uh, very basic engagement questions. And what I love about this graph is they've taken the results, and this was a survey done throughout the Middle East, so the GCC and the wider Middle East. 
after receiving the answers to these questions, they actually split the answers up between HR staff and other employees. Now let's have a look at this. Basic question is, do you feel engaged at work? Roughly 34% of other employees said they were engaged, which matches up with our usual engagement surveys that we run. In HR, 68, 69% of HR employees felt engaged. The next question, standard engagement question, would you recommend this company to a friend or a colleague? Again, huge difference between what HR think and what other employees think. Our employers are thinking 38% said yes, we would recommend. A massive 81% of HR employees would recommend the company to somebody else. Fair benefits, again, massive difference. 48% of employees and roughly 70% of HR employees said that the benefits given in the organizations were fair. The next question is one that we'd all expect when it comes to saying, are we receiving enough salary? Do we get a good compensation? There's going to be a big dip there, but still quite a big gap between what HR think of as a fair compensation and what other employees do. The last question is one that gives me a lot of concern. The question, the actual question that was asked was, do you see yourself in the company in two years time? 42% of employees said, yes, I do see myself here in two years' time. And a massive 83% in HR said, yes. Now, the worry for me is that if 42% of our employees see themselves here in two years' time, that means that 58% of them are trying to leave. Now, of course, your turnover figures will tell you that they won't leave. Many of them can't leave. They can't find other jobs, perhaps at the same salary or at a better salary. But the fact that 58% are actively trying to get out of the company is a worry. But I want to park that particular issue for today and just focus on this massive gap in perception between what HR think about the company and about what other employees think of the company. It's a massive perception gap and there can be many reasons and factors why we think differently to other employees. But I want you to keep that perception gap in mind as we start to talk about the service we offer. Because I think we'll find that the same thing happens. We perhaps think that the service we offer our employees is really good. I wonder what our employees think. Do they agree with that assessment or do they think we're pretty bad? So what I'm going to talk about is something called service gaps. I mean, you may have bumped into this kind of thing. It's the same theory that we use in customer service or customer experience. And what we want to find out is what do our customers, our wonderful employees, think of the service we provide and compare that against what we say we provide. When we compare what we say we provide against what our customers say we provide, we have what's called the service perception gap. And that last graph from Conexa was a similar kind of perception gap. So let's have a look at how we're actually going to measure this thing. Human resource functions, as it says on the slide, have traditionally played a service role to complement their functional activities. And I hope you agree with that. We're often called a support function or a support service. What we actually are is we have a service role to play. We have activities to carry out, tasks and objectives to achieve. But we also, I hope you'll agree, supply a service to our employees. Now to measure service, whether it's customer service or whether it's employee internal customer service, uh, we're going to use an adaption of the Parasuraman service quality model of 1990. And I urge you to actually learn that off by heart so you can impress your managers with it. And it's used to measure service quality gaps where HR is the service provider, line and employees are the customer. And what we're going to try and discover is our critical service delivery gaps. The Paris Araman model breaks service down into five service quality dimensions. And here they are for you. And if you ever go to a restaurant nowadays or take your car in for a service or visit a hotel, they'll probably give you a little... Uh, customer service questionnaire to answer and if you have a look or if you remember what they are all about you'll probably recognize these service quality dimensions 
the first thing that any service provider wants to know is, you know, what do we look like? What's our ambience? Do we look professional? So we look at the tangibles and appearance. What's it like in HR? Do we have good professional equipment in there? Do we look and feel professional when we communicate with our employees or with the organization as a whole? Again, is that a professional form of communication? Does it look and feel good, in other words, the tangible of the service? The next part of the uh, service quality dimension is reliability. So we need to try and measure whether or not our functions and our service that we give is given dependably and the information that we give our employees is accurate stuff that they can use the third one is quite an important one are we willing to help our employees and provide prompt service some of you now are beginning to think well Paul this is a little objective isn't it what is a prompt actually mean but I'm afraid when we talk about customer service or even employee service or internal customer service it does become a little subjective because beauty is in the eye of the beholder what one person will think of as prompt service somebody else may think it's rather tardy or late but that's what we have to put up with when we're trying to support our employees the fourth dimension insurance do our HR staff have the correct knowledge and are they courteous to, H to our employees when they visit or call? In other words, do our HR staff inspire trust and confidence amongst employees? And the last dimension is empathy. Does HR treat its employees as individuals or do we treat them like numbers? I often ask the question when we do this in seminars, uh, which of these is the most important? And again, it probably depends on the customer themselves. But surprisingly, in all the surveys that have been done worldwide, whether it's customer or HR, uh, the actual professional part of it, the tangibles and the appearance, are not important at all to customers. They don't really care that we've got ergodynamic desks or 17-inch flat screens uh, for our computers. They don't really care about that stuff. What they really do care about is do we give them accurate information and do we provide prompt service? And to go back to the Conexa perception uh, graph again, sometimes we think we're doing a good job. Sometimes we follow an a process and we follow it 100% at a time. I run a course here with Informer called the HR Audit where we actually do audit HR functions and it is surprising how many times that we look at a process and find that HR do actually follow the process very well but when we ask our customers what they think of that process they think it's awful, they think it's rubbish and a common example that comes up is the service we provide our customers, our employees with uh, a certificate of salary, a salary certificate. Now think for a moment why an employee would ask HR for a salary certificate. It's for a credit card or it's for a mortgage or it's for a car loan. An employee is about to get himself or herself in debt and they need a salary certificate from HR. How long does it take you to provide that service? Now, some of you out there will say, well, we have HRMS, so they just go on to their self-service part of, of HRMS and they print the certificate themselves. Good for you if that's the case. But most companies will say, well, it depends what it's for. Some banks will ask for an actual written signature. And if anybody needs a written signature, it has to go to HR. So think, have we got empathy with the employee in this service? Think to yourself, if you ever had the uh, opportunity if you've ever had the experience of buying a new car. How long does it take you to choose a new car? The answer is probably around a month by the time you've shopped around, negotiated, chosen the various models, done test drives. But after that one month you suddenly decide this is the car I want and I hope you've all chosen a Ford Explorer. The salesman turns around to you, you make the deal, you shake hands, and the salesman actually says to you, I've just checked our stock, we have the, your car in stock, we can bring it down from our warehouse or our car park tomorrow, polish it up, you can drive it away tomorrow afternoon. That makes us very excited, that makes us very keen enthusiastic. And the salesman says, all I need 
is a salary certificate. So we phone HR or we send HR an email and get a reply that our service level agreement for a salary certificate is three days. Now you will be saying, what's wrong with that? The employer will be saying, that's absolute rubbish. That's really, really bad service. And you will reply, well, that's our process. That's our service level agreement. We do it when we're supposed to. We take three days. It says three days. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing. But I hope you'll agree with me that it is an awful rubbish service. Yes, it follows the process. Yes, it's in line with your policy. But does your customer enjoy it? No, not at all. It's terrible. It's not reliable. It's not responsive. And even worse, we begin to doubt and to have lack of confidence in your ability to do a simple thing. You might say to the employee, well, that's our service level agreement and we have to get the letter. We have to check the figures. We have to put it on the desk for the HR director to sign it. But you all know that the HR director doesn't even look at it when he signs it. He just signs a bunch of uh, certificates and sends them off. So can we improve this kind of service? And this is the tricky thing about HR service. We may be following our processes. We may be doing things right according to our policies. But are we actually giving the service that people need? Worldwide, uh, people test this Parasaraman model uh, on, an, on an annual basis to see what customers are actually finding important and which is not so important. And you can see there that customers, and this is a worldwide survey, so it includes HRs uh, from, from, from all over the world. It's not GCC specific. But they're saying here that what's most important to customers is reliability. If we ask you for something, can we depend that what you give us is accurate? Second, what I've been talking about just now with my example of the salary certificate, is responsiveness. How quick do you respond to a request for service from an employee? Third, knowledge and courtesy. And I think we should all in the GCC be rather concerned if that's the case here. I mean, have a, have a look yourself. How do you treat an employee when he or she comes into HR? Do we jump up to greet them? Are they left waiting? Are they ignored? When an employee rings HR helpline, how many rings does it take before somebody actually picks it up? When we do pick the phone up, is it the right person who's picking up the phone with the knowledge to answer the employee? And you know, how do you answer the phone? Do you welcome the employee or do you just say, what's up? How are the people treated? Empathy comes forth with 18%. And as I said in my earlier example, the actual tangibles, the overall appearance of physical facilities, our 17-inch screens, our ergodynamic desks, our nice plants mean very little to people and it's something unfortunately we spend a lot of time looking at. So how do we do it? It's called the service audit and it's actually, as you'd expect, it's a questionnaire. It's a survey using a questionnaire and I want you to keep this very, very simple. Some of you may now be thinking, okay, we can use SurveyMonkey or monkey survey, there's two of them out there, to actually conduct this uh, kind of questionnaire. Uh, as I said at the bottom of this slide, I urge you to go old school with this. People, employees in particular, do not trust online surveys. They do not believe that the information they give is kept confidential. So what I actually suggest is that we go old school, Word document, print it out, 10 questions and ask 10 questions, general questions, two for each of the five dimensions. So two questions around tangibles, two questions around reliability, and so on. Again, keep this very, very simple indeed. Please don't ask employees to describe a situation when or to give comments. You know that nobody fills up these kind of questionnaires. So keep it nice and simple. A simple you know, yes, no answer, or if you want to, you can use the Lichter scale, one to five, you know, one, I agree strongly with this statement, or five, I do not agree, whatever. And also, when we go old school, what I always do when I hold these service audits, as they're called, or service surveys, is to actually take the paper down to the department myself, walk into the department, 
with a hundred questionnaires, put a big box on a table, and to ask the employees to take out three or four minutes to fill in the questionnaires, and when they're finished, throw them in the box. I don't give space for employees to put their name. I don't ask them for their payroll number or any information at all that can identify them. Just 10 questions on a piece of paper with yes or no or a one to five scale. I usually do this in the morning, around about half past nine, 10 o'clock. And then I come back at half past three and find that nobody's done it. And that's why you go back at half past three, just to remind them, come on guys, before you leave to go home, take a couple of minutes, fill this in. And there you have it. You'll have a hundred people telling you what they think of HR, whether you're professional, whether you're reliable, whether they trust you, and whether they or not you show empathy for customers. I think you all know that you're going to find the answers are going to be very, very bad indeed. And many of you will actually start to struggle and try to find excuses why we shouldn't do it, or if we do do it, why the answers are so bad. I urge you to think again about this. Uh, my American friends have got a wonderful phrase when it comes to surveys. If one person calls you a horse, ignore them. Feel free to ignore them. It's one person. If a hundred people call you a horse, it's time to buy a saddle. You are a horse. And I think we need to accept the same thing in HR. If one or two people say HR is rubbish, ignore them. If 100 people say that HR service is very, very bad, I think we owe it to our employees to do something about it. And I hope you agree. Once we have the results, and even if they are very, very bad, they must be reported back. I know, I know one company here in the Gulf who actually put the results on a screensaver. Very brave indeed. And they put it on a screensaver, even though the results were awful. Uh, the headline uh, for, the, for the screensaver, you have told us that HR is very bad. Thank you. That's a brave way to go about it. But it actually, by doing something like that, you begin already to claw back the trust that people have lost within HR. What do we do next? It's okay communicating that we're not very good in terms of service. What's our next step? As I said earlier, accept the results and then get down there. Get down to the departments that are filled in the questionnaire for you. Get focus groups, get workshops and work to improve as much as you can. Even in focus groups, you'll find that people won't really want to talk to you face to face. So what I tend to do is to get 10 people together who have done the survey, walk into the room, and on a flip chart, just put a plus and a minus with a line down the middle of the flip chart paper. I then hand one of the uh, flip chart markers to one of the employees and ask them to have a little chat for 20 minutes and to make a list for me of things that are good about HR and things that are bad. I then leave the room have a nice cup of coffee, answer some emails, and 20 minutes later, return to the room to find there's very little on the positive side and a big list on the negative side. And then we can get to work. We can start to improve what we have. Those of you who have perhaps attended my courses will uh, see this kind of thing all the time. Um, do we need to change in HR? Yes. Does change necessarily lead to improvement? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. As you all know, change can sometimes make things absolutely worse. Uh, many of you out there will have been through a large reorganization that ended up in uh, quite a chaotic situation for many people. So the thing we have to grasp in HR is that just making a change doesn't necessarily lead to improvement. But what I want you to think about is the thing down the bottom there. If we want to improve, we've got to change. Now, I think you all do want to improve. In fact, sometimes managers ask the wrong question. If you ask a group of employees, do you want to change? The answer will be, no, no, we're okay. We're doing okay. Leave us alone. If you ask the question, do you want to improve? They will say, yes, of course. And then you can say to them, well, how can you actually improve without changing? Because nothing improves by itself. Nothing in this world, nothing in life will ever actually get better unless you make some kind of change to it. So if we want to improve our service to our employees, and I hope you agree with me that we do, then something has to change. 
What is it that has to change? I don't know. It could be that thing that we all talk about, attitude, and there's certainly something to be said for that. But within each of your separate companies, it will be something different. Collect the results of the surveys from your employees. See what they find most important. Is it a trust issue? Is it confidence? Is it accuracy? Is it promptness of service? And then we have to make changes to the way we do things. In some cases, we may have to actually change our processes to make them speedier or more accurate. We have to do something. If you asked our employees what kind of service level we in HR give to them, how do you think they'd answer? Would they say that we're given a basic service? That it's, well, the kind of expected thing that we get from HR? Or would they say that it is surprisingly good? Or would they even go beyond that and say the service we get from HR is absolutely unbelievable? Again, this is something you might be able to want to do or you might want to do on uh, a survey to get them to assess levels of service. I mean, what is a basic level of service from HR? Uh, well, a basic level of service, of course, is what we used to call personnel. I uh, come into HR, I ask for something, and eventually I get it. It's not prompt, it's not reliable, but eventually, one week later, they'll reply to me and give me some information. What's an expected level of service? Well, an expected level of service, of course, is what you lay, lay out in your policies. I expect to get a salary certificate in three days. I expect you to recruit somebody in 90 days. I expect, I expect. They don't always get it, of course. Now, what makes it surprising? Surprising is when you deliver a service to an employee that he or she has never had before, or in a way that is surprisingly quick, surprisingly dependable, surprisingly good service out there. I was with a company recently and they were trying to look for ways of how they could surprise their customers and uh, their employees. And what came up was uh, doing something on their birthday. And uh, this I know has become kind of common practice in many organizations, but it's a good example of levels of service. When it's somebody's birthday in your organization, what do you do? Do you send them an email? Do you send them a text? You send them an e-card. That can all be very, very nice indeed. What this company was thinking of doing was buying a muffin. So when it was an employee's birthday, we got them a muffin, put a candle in it, and went downstairs or upstairs or out to the department and gave them a lovely muffin on their birthday. Now, that's what I call surprising service. The surprising thing that happened because of that is that the HR department were told by some people that it wasn't culturally appropriate to give somebody a muffin. And what was even more surprising was that HR challenged that old feeling and actually got it through. So that's the kind of thing perhaps we should be looking for. Some of you may think that's a silly example, but it's the kind of thing that does surprise and delight people. What can we do to actually surprise people? Above that, there's another level of service, which is unbelievable. This is something that only happens now and again, something that uh, an employee will talk about, perhaps with his or her family and with other employees. I went to ask HR for something, and unbelievably, this is what they did for me. They're, they're so helpful. They're unbelievable. So have a look. What kind of service do you give to your people? One thing you will be aware of, of course, or if you're not, you should be, is that if you do something that's surprising today and you do something surprising every day for employees, it becomes expected. And so the muffin that I was talking about will very soon become expected. And if we want to surprise employees again, we'll have to think of something else. Improvement equals change. There is another level of service, but it's not on top of unbelievable. It's actually below basic. And it's also called unbelievable, but this time it's unbelievably bad service. It's service so bad it doesn't even meet the basics. The kind of service where you contact HR and they never get back to you. The kind of service where they say that I'll pass it on to somebody and that person never gets back to you. This is unbelievably bad service. So just bear that in mind when you do your next survey. If somebody says to you, your service is unbelievable, before you thank them, make sure which unbelievable they're talking about. The unbelievably good or the unbelievably bad. 
This made me laugh recently. I urge you to try it. It's Google, of course, so with their algorithms, they change all the time. But if you type in HR space IS, don't put in HRIS, you'll get lots of adverts for Oracle. If you put in HR space IS, see what comes up on your laptop or on your screen. HR is not your friend. HR is useless. HR is evil. HR is a joke. Uh, I listed this out. I took a screenshot of it. This was done uh, a couple of months ago because at the bottom of the list that Google was showing me at the time, the one that we want to be, is HR is a strategic partner. I'm not saying this is a validated scientific uh, survey of what people think about HR, uh, but it's certainly what people are looking for or typing into Google up there. So I say it changes on a daily basis because of algorithms, but you try it. It'll uh, hopefully make you laugh, but more important than that, actually get you to start thinking, we need to change this perception of HR. I urge you, to be brave enough to print this slide out on A3 paper and stick it on the front of the door to HR. Hello employees, welcome to HR and thank you for paying our salaries. I've got a feeling some of you might be switching off the uh, webinar at this stage, but please stay with me. It's important. The guys who come into HR are the guys who are earning revenue in the company, cutting costs in the company, meeting productivity and sales targets, and actually bringing in the money. They're the people who pay our salaries. What we have to do is change the way we treat our employees. Even if we're treating them well at the moment, let's treat them better. What we need to do is have this kind of attitude with everybody in HR. Our employees who come in, who annoy us sometimes, who come in at the wrong times when we're busy, who expect us to do the unexpected, these guys pay our salaries. It's why we're there. We're there to support them. So I urge you, do a service audit. Take the time to do this questionnaire. Find out what they think of us and then do something to change the way that we give this service to our employees. That's it from me. I'm willing and able, hopefully, to answer any questions that you may have. Hi, I've got a, a very interesting question here from uh, Layla, Layla El Houthi. She says, hi, Paul, please give us examples of HR metrics that we have to consider to measure our service level. Uh, very good question, Layla. There is a full list of questions, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that have been uh, compiled by Mercers as best practice uh, metrics when it comes to service of HR. They've, they've got a whole range of metrics for HR effectiveness, HR productivity, and HR service levels. Unfortunately, Layla and others, I don't have that slide with me, but what I'll do, I'll send it over to Cherie at the end of this uh, webinar, and she can put it in with the pack. Uh, to go there. Uh, some of them are pretty, uh, pretty, pretty basic stuff, but there, there is a best practice list that will be part of the pack at the end of the uh, webinar. Thank you. Another nice question there from Raju. Um, how do you compare service HR in Middle East companies. Uh, once again, Raju, I'm, I'm, I'm coming up short here. I've never seen a breakdown. I've seen various global surveys that have taken place. Uh, and I've also seen surveys uh, like the ones in Conexa uh, that have been done purely in the Middle East. I haven't actually seen a full HR service that breaks down the difference perhaps between the US, Europe, Middle East, Asia and Australia. Uh, Perhaps that's something we can all Google after we've had fun putting in HR Gap IS. Uh, so sorry about that. 
Uh, Mohammed Malik, how often should HR conduct an employee service satisfaction survey? Once a year is the answer, Mohammed. What tends to happen, as you've probably realized, is that this survey is very general. It's asking about all of HR. Now, what you may want to do, and only do this kind of thing once a year, but you may want to run other surveys, for example, that focus just on uh, benefits and compensation or just on the training department. Again, a similar type of survey, but getting more detailed about a particular section. But once a year is plenty. Uh, we seem to be running out of questions. Has anybody else got any other questions for us? Okay, Raju. All right, well, with that, um, as Sherry said at the beginning, the webinar will be downloaded. Um, oh, thank you for your lovely comments there, Asitha. That's uh, nice. <laughs> Uh, nice from Layla as well. Hi again. How can we change the culture of hating HR? Uh, I don't know if any of you follow me out there on Twitter. It seems like you do, Layla. Uh, my Twitter handle is at why we hate HR. Uh, the way we change the culture, Layla, is by doing things different. Culture, as you know, is just the way we do things around here. Now, unfortunately, in HR, we changed our name from personnel to HR. Many of you out there are changing from HR to human capital. Some of you are calling yourself human talent or talent management. Uh, we're changing the name, but we're not changing the way we're doing things. If we don't change the way we do things, we don't change the culture. So one of the best ways we can change the culture, Layla, is to conduct a survey like the one that we've, I've just outlined and then improve change the way we do things. When we change the way we do things, we change the, the, the culture of the organization. But you're quite right. As I mentioned in my introduction, we are in a dangerous area. We're in a dangerous time for HR. People do hate us above and below. We need to start changing it now. Another very good question. My, you guys are bright today. A good question here from Asama. Is the level of attrition an indication of HR service? Off the top of my head, Asama, I would say no. Uh, turnover, people leaving our organization, although we could be a, a factor within that, the fact that they feel we're not doing well. If you analyze your exit interviews, you'll find that most people are leaving because they've got bad bullying bosses. One thing we are linked with, it's usually the second reason, the second biggest reason why people leave, is that there's no career development within the organization or people feel they're not being developed. Now, I think we have to take our share of responsibility uh, for that, although it is generally the line managers who are responsible for it. So I would say our level of service as a uh, a factor or a contributory factor to attrition would be very small. But some of the things that we do or do or should do, like looking after performance management and career development, could actually be a bigger factor in uh, attrition, as you call it, or turnover. Magdalene Sammy, hello there, good afternoon. Asks to change the culture, sorry, can we apply the same kind of surveys for other functions? Yes, of course we can. Uh, this can be done in any other function at all. It's, it's the actual survey or the dimensions I mentioned are ones used by virtually every customer service organization in the world. They'll have different questions, of course, but they stick to this format of measuring tangibles, reliability, accuracy, and so on. So yes, you can use it in marketing, finance, operations. And as I said, if you have a very large HR department, you may want to do one just for the recruitment section, just for training, just for payroll, etc. Ah, Asitha, to change the culture, we have to change from the top. I mean CEO level. There is absolutely no doubt that the CEO and the top team have got a lot to do when it comes to leading from the front. But I also don't believe that we should leave it to them or wait for them to change first. We're all part of the culture, Asitha, so we need to do our bit. 
whether or not other people aren't doing theirs. And perhaps we could be the leader in this. Perhaps we could be a role model for changing culture. A fan, I've been waiting for this question, well done. A fan, Sheikh, who asks, how good HR service will help the business bottom line? It all depends, a fan, how much you believe in Maslow and the hierarchy of needs. Maslow basically says that if somebody is feeling esteem, somebody feels nice at work, they'll be more productive. If we're giving good service to our employees, that will certainly motivate them. If we're looking after them and supporting them, they'll feel better, they'll be more motivated, they'll be more productive, and that will hit the bottom line. Oh, good. Asith has got it. Magdalene says, thank you. If you'd like to know more about this, uh, I do run a course called HR Audit. I run it three times a year. I've already done it once this year. If you log on to Informer, they'll give you the dates. Uh, as well as looking at the HR service audit, we also look at how we actually do a functional audit, looking at making sure our process and our policies are correct. We also look at compliance in terms of other things we do in legal. And we have a quick look also at a financial audit. So if you're really interested in this kind of thing, I look forward to seeing you towards the end of the year after Ramadan and Eid. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I enjoyed your questions. Uh, hope to see you at the next one. Bye.